Hey folks, this is Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Lecture 3 of Arrow 3271. Today we're going to be starting our study into fatigue. So what we've studied so far, we've always been dealing with static loads. Whether the loads are static or dynamic, we have converted them so that we can analyze them as if they're just a static load being applied to the structure. That makes things quite a bit more simple. When we're talking about fatigue, what we're saying is that the repeated nature of the loading is having a detrimental effect. It's kind of like if you've ever done bench press, you usually warm up and then you work up to your max as much as you can push and then you work back down. Now, the, what we warm up with, maybe you're warming up with 135. If you warm up with that, it feels rather light. And then you go up and you lift your max weight and it feels heavy, even undoable. But if you continue to try and pump out reps with the lower weight, your muscles are going to fatigue. It's going to be harder and harder until eventually you can't lift it anymore. And if you keep going beyond that, you could actually hurt yourself. Materials are people too. And if you load them once, even if it's not even close to the your allowable, and then repeat that over and over, eventually the material can wear out. Now, if the, lo the loads are low enough, then the material may not experience a fatigue failure. But even for rather low loads, we're going to find that materials can fail in fatigue. So we're going to be looking at loading that produces stresses that are variable and repeated and maybe fluctuating. We're actually going to develop this whole fatigue concept in a series of lectures. The first one on fatigue, then we're going to look at the endurance limit and a little deeper into that. We're going to look at how to handle when the stresses are, have a different fluctuation pattern. And then we're going to look at how to put together different, completely different types of loading so we can analyze the complete fatigue picture. Okay. Now, this little sample here shows what a part looks like. This looks like a round sample. And if we look at this, we can see that it failed. It looks like all these little marks, these little ridges on the thing, looks kind of like the water at the beach washed up on the sand and caused these little ridges. And so these are called beach marks because it looks like those little ridges. And if we look at those beach marks, it looks like they're all emanating or coming from that point A. Looks like that was where they started. Maybe there was a little defect there. Looks like this is a threaded fastener or something, and it looks like there may have been a little defect at the thread. Then slowly, under over time, it was a sh a really slow at first, and it got faster and faster. You can see first it looks rather smooth and polished. That means that the progression of the fatigue failure was so slow as to make so it took a long time so there's hardly any difference between the different marks that's good <clears throat> as we go further into region b we see more and more pronounced beach marks which means even though it's growing slowly it's growing faster and faster then area c it looks like all of a sudden, instead of opening the parts opening like this, first really slowly and then more faster and faster, and eventually it just rips off like it pulled all the roots out of the ground. That's what that C section, that's where we have what's called fast fracture because it just ripped off. It's like just doing a static tension test where the material just rips apart, okay? So all this is slowly opening. Looks like the crack's getting bigger and bigger, and then suddenly it rips off. The P over A, there's not enough area left for the P over A to withstand against like FTU. So stage one is where we have initiation. Stage two is where it progresses slowly. Stage three is where it kind of is fast fracture, just rips apart. Okay, We're going to look at these. As we look at fatigue, we're actually going to handle fatigue. We're not really going to deal with the different stages other than be able to recognize some of those in parts. We're basically going to characterize our structure and loading against a myriad of test data. We're then going to look at a different approach that handles this, uh, which is called damage tolerance, which we actually look at some of these different stages. 
So we're going to have uh, three major, there are three major fatigue life models. Our stress life model, where we basically are looking at the stresses and how they relate to fatigue. This is called the least accurate of the three, but this is actually the one that most everybody uses because it's simple, straightforward, and it works. The strain life method, where we're looking at the strains that occur, that actually has potential to be more accurate, but it's quite, it can be quite a bit more difficult. And then the linear elastic fracture mechanics method, also called damage tolerance. We're going to cover that after we finish studying fatigue. Okay. So basically, we're going to be looking at the stress life method in the next four lectures. And then we're going to take two lectures to look at the fracture mechanics method. Two different ways of estimating fatigue life or the life of a structure under repeated loads. Okay, so our goal is to find what the strength is. Either we're going to be looking for how many cycles the part will be good for for a certain loading, or what stress level can I go to if I need to be good for a number of cycles. Now, all the data is developed a guy named Moore came up with an idea, and he came up with a polished sample that's about this big, and it was highly polished, like this one shown here. And what he did is he loaded it in bending, picture bending that thing. So now we have tension down here and compression up here. And then he rotated it, and as he rotates at that same point, it goes from max tension to no loading to max compression to no loading, back to max tension, and on again. Okay? This is like a perfect sample. You'll notice he has a nice uh, machined surface so that the stresses develop, the peak stresses occur right here in the middle, and that it's polished so that there are no stress risers. So it's nearly got zero stress risers. That gives us the most accurate value for just seeing what the material properties are for this kind of loading. This is called a fully reverse stress cycle because we're going from tension to compression and back to tension in a nice smooth sinusoidal kind of manner. Okay, We're going to call this like a perfect sample, a perfect pristine sample. Okay, This idea was came up uh, was developed by this guy named Moore back in uh, I think the early 1900s or something. And uh, basically our sample, once again, we said it was machined and polished. We said it's loaded in pure bending. There's no shear applied. And it's completely reversing the loading. And, and then if we plot the stress level, so if we take it to one stress level and then turn it until it fails, and then a different stress level and turn it until it fails, and then a different stress level and turn it until it fails, we can get a plot of the number of cycles to failure against the stress level we're at, the fully reversed stress level. This idea of fully reversed stress level, remember, means we're going from tension to compression to tension to compression, fully reversed, of a perfect pristine sample. This is the foundation of fatigue. If we had allowed defects to be in this sample, then our results would have scattered based on the defects we see. So this perfect pristine sample means this is the best we can get with this material. And by using this kind of approach, we can do less testing and characterize the materials more fully. Now, nothing's perfect and very few parts are designed like this and loaded like this. Uh, However, if we can get this so we can really understand how the material behaves, we then can tweak the method to account for other changes in our geometry and loading and other things. And generally, we're going to do that with a series of factors and some tweaks to our analysis. Okay, But this perfect pristine sample is going to give us the foundation for what we're going to do. Now, if we took that plot, we've got the number of cycles here and the stress level here, and we plotted out all the failures, we would find this nonlinear curve, which is very hard to predict from. If we then plotted that, replotted that data on log log paper, we would get a curve like what's shown down here from Shigley, figure 610 from Shigley. And what we see is we can now see three distinct linear, roughly linear curves. We're going to call that first curve low cycle fatigue, going out to about 1,000 cycles. The second straight line curve, high cycle fatigue. And everything to the right where that curve levels out, 
we're going to call that infinite life. You'll see that since that's nearly flat, what that means is if our stress level is below this limit, this lower, it looks like 50 KSI for this material, particular material, that means if you stay below 50 KSI, that part may never fail. So we call that the endurance limit. Okay. We're going to see three knees. So if this were a steel sample, if this perfect sample were a steel sample, then we would see a curve similar to this. And our we've got three linear curves. One of them, the knees of the curve. So it looks like if we have, you'll notice the cycles are going from 10 to 0. Now remember, 10 to the 0 is one cycle. 10 to the 1 is 10 cycles and so on, right? We're going to see the first knee of the curve. If we only had one cycle, what would we expect to be good for in tension? FTU, right? Okay. So this first point is called, uh, we're showing this using Shigley notation, so it's called capital S-U-T, but basically that's our FTU, right? So for one cycle, it should be good for FTU. Now, remember one difference. When we have FTU, remember we got the stress-strain curve, the max value is what we fail at. All that means is we can get to the max value. On this curve here, what we're seeing is that FTU means we got to tension FTU and then back down to the compression. That would be one cycle, otherwise it's half cycle, right? So already to say that we're good for FTU, there's a bit of a stretch without data, but it looks like we've got some data there, which says, yeah, if we can go to the tension FTU, we ought to be able to go to the compression FTU and still not fail. That's one cycle. And if we then do that again, that's our second cycle and so on. So our first knee is here at 10 to the 1, or at 1 cycle with FTU. Our second knee of the curve is out here at 1,000 cycles. Okay? 10 to the 3, you see that? 1,000 cycles. That's where the next change happens. And the next knee is out here at 10 to the 6 cycles. Now you may look and say, well, hey, that's not 10 to the 3rd cycles. That's something slightly different. Well, there are slight variances, but basically we're going to pretend that we've got three knees to a steel curve. 10 to the 1, which has FTU, 10 to the 3, 1,000 cycles, and 10 to the 6th. Now, at 10 to the 1, that's FTU. At 10 to the 6th, we're going to call that the endurance limit, and we're going to use the, sub, the, the nomenclature capital S sub E for the stress. It's a stress, and it's the endurance limit of the material, which means below that, at or below that, the part should last forever. That means it will be in heaven still cycling after we die, if that were true. Now, whether or not you believe that, that's what this means, and that's what we're going to use or pretend to be true. Okay, And it seems to be mostly true within our lifetimes for what we try and test these materials to. Now, at 10 to the third, then, that means all we got to do is find what stress level does 10 to the third apply for. We're going to have a little approach I'm going to develop for figuring out what that is. Once we know these three inflection points, we then can characterize our fatigue curve in this manner. Okay? That's what we're going to be doing. We said that, we said that, we said that. So, some basic terms we need to understand. Okay, S sub E is the endurance limit. Remember, below, at and below that, if we keep our stress level below that, the part should left forever. How many cycles is that? Infinite. S sub F has got the idea of fatigue strength. Now, fatigue strength is for a certain number of cycles. For example, if we only have one cycle, what's our fatigue strength? FTU. If we have a million cycles, what's our fatigue strength? S sub E. Five billion cycles. S sub E is our S sub F. Our fatigue strength is the endurance limit in that case. If we have 10 to the 6th or more cycles... If we're good for that, then the endurance strength, S sub F, or the fatigue strength, S sub F, is S sub E. If we only have one cycle, that's the fatigue strength is FTU. And for any other point, we can look at the curve to determine what our fatigue strength is. For example, what is the fatigue strength at 100, uh, 10 cycles? Whatever that is, right? Boom. What is the fatigue strength at a thousand cycles? It's right there. 
What is the fatigue strength at 10,000 cycles, right? And so on, and so on, and so on. Just read the curve. That gives us the fatigue strength. So the fatigue strength is associated with a number of cycles. The endurance limit is associated with 10 to the 6 cycles, and so on. Do you see how that works? Okay. Okay, so here is a similar curve for aluminum. We see, now this curve starts at 10 to the third, or 1,000 cycles, so this is really only the high cycle fatigue range. And it goes from 10 to the third to 10 to the blah, blah, blah. And you'll notice the knee, while with steels we saw the knee was here at 10 to the six cycles, with aluminums you see it seems like the knee shifts and different aluminums t behave differently. But it looks like for aluminums, that knee is somewhere at 10 to the 7th or 10 to the 8th. And if we look at the, the stress level at 10 to the 3rd, we see that ranges from about 30 KSI to about 80 KSI. Well, that looks like up here in the wrought alloys, that looks like about the FTUs we've been using for aluminums. What this implies to me is that there may be no reduction in strength for aluminums in the low cycle fatigue range. We're going to pretend that there is a reduction in strength, but it appears this data or the this curve suggests there may not be. Even though aluminums from this curve, it looks like they may have no effect for low cycle fatigue and that the endurance limit or the um, knee of the second knee of the curve occurs at a higher value than for steels. We're going to go ahead and use the same values of 10 to the third with some strength and 10 to the sixth for the endurance limit for aluminums, okay? All right, here is another curve. Now, what this is showing is the endurance limit. So what they've done is they've gone and taken different steels. These are all steels here. And these steels being made differently have different FTUs, different allowables. And what they do is they go and test and determine what the endurance limit is. What they find is they have, if they have a weak steel, like a 60 KSI steel, then they're getting an endurance limit of about, oh, 20 or 30 KSI. If they have a stronger steel, like a 100 KSI, they're getting something around, what, 55 or something KSI. If they have a 180 KSI steel, that's a very common steel for aerospace, then they're getting a value of about 90 KSI and so on. We see that although there's a lot of data scatter with this data, the data is roughly linear. That there seems to be a relationship, a linear relationship between tension strength on the horizontal axis and endurance limit. Now, that linear relationship seems to deteriorate once you get above about 200 KSI. It seems to deteriorate and doesn't quite follow the same curve. What this does is lead us to an approximation. What this means is, since we often have the FTU of the material we're going to use, we can estimate the endurance limit from FTU. And for steels, we're going to pretend that it's 50% of FTU. So if your steel is 180 KSI, your endurance limit will be one half of that. Now I want you to notice here that that endurance limit that we show, S sub B, has a little prime on it. What that means is this is the endurance limit. If we actually had a perfect round sample loaded in pure bending, going from tension to compression in a nice sinusoidal manner, polished, perfect sample, this is the endurance limit for that sample. How many of these kinds of samples are on aircraft? None. So we're going to use this pristine endurance limit only this lecture and then we're going to go on to come up with a better endurance limit that applies to our parts. We're always going to start with this perfect pristine endurance limit and then we're going to tweak it and I'll show you how to do that. Okay? So keep that in mind. So S of B prime or the perfect endurance limit. Next notice, because this curve seems to deteriorate above about 200 KSI, what this implies is if uh, that the this linear relationship only is valid to about 200 KSI. So what we're going to do is just say, okay, we'll use this 50% relationship all the way up to 200 KSI. And then 
we're not going to go any higher. So above 200 KSI, we're just going to use 100 KSI as our allowable. So we're just going to cut that off just to be safe, okay? This is how we're going to deal with steels. Now we're going to deal with it similarly but differently in aluminum and other materials. So before we go on to that, once again, this is what our, our SN, this is called the SN curve because S is the stress and N the number of cycles. Now I've trained you guys now so you know that the allowable is generally capital F. But when they're talking about fatigue, it's pretty universal to use S for the allowable stress level. What that means is, this is called the SN curve. Remember here, we have a low cycle fatigue range. That's going from 1 to 1,000 cycles. And a high cycle fatigue range, which is going from 1,000 to a 1 million cycles. We have the finite life range which means it's mortal, it will die just like you and me, going from one to a million cycles. And the infinite life range, this is from 10 to the 6 onward, that means uh, that will part will live forever. You need to understand those things. Here's our approach then. We're going to say, okay, the fatigue strength, we're going to start with, we're going to need the fatigue strength at each of these inflection points. The fatigue strength, if we have one cycle, should be F to U. That's pretty simple and straightforward. Okay. And if we next go to this place of where we, where we have the first knee of the curve, if we just say, okay, let's just define this as a fraction of FTU. So we already are used to using FTU for a lot of things. Let's keep using that FTU and let's come up with a factor we just apply up against it. We'll call it lowercase f. Now you got to be careful because in our class, in aerospace, lowercase f typically means calculated stress. In this lecture this is the fatigue strength fraction okay fatigue strength fraction that's not the applied stress it's the fatigue strength fraction so if we just come up with a factor a little f that we're going to apply to f to you now if we have a steel what we're going to do is go to this curve down here and read whatever is on the horizontal axis we've got f to u of the material so you go to the f to u of the material and you can read what the fatigue stress fraction is okay now, we're not going to use this curve because I've curve fit it for you. If you read this curve, your numbers are going to be all over the place. I'm going to expect you to use this curve fit that you'll see at the top of the curve, and it's in your handbook. The little stress fraction is you just plug in your FTU into this polynomial. That SUT is just FTU in disguise. So you plug into that equation, and you'll get the stress fraction, and you'll apply that to your FTU. You got that? Uh, now, once again, actually, we'll talk about this next time, but for this stress fraction is for steels. If we have anything else, we're going to use something else. We're going to use 0.9 for aluminums and titaniums rather than this table. This table, this equation is just for steels. Okay. Next, we have the endurance. At, at 1 million cycles, remember, we should be good for the endurance limit. And for steels, we know that it's... Our, endur our pristine endurance limit is half of the, the FTU. For aluminums, we're actually going to look at this further next time, but we're going to use 40% of FTU. And for other materials, you will check your handbook. It's got a little table for what fraction of FTUs to use and whether or not there's a cutoff. Okay? So, since our curve, you see between our first inflection point and our second inflection point, we have a straight line. So we can actually write the equation for that line that's given here. The fatigue strength is just a coefficient A times the number of cycles to the B power, where A is the intercept and B is the slope. The And if we rearrange that to calculate the number of cycles, we get this equation here, where our A, the intercept, is obviously just F to U, and the slope we can define, I've calculated it for you, is just one-third of the log base 10 of that strength fraction F. Okay? So, if we have a stress level above F times F to U, or if we have a number of cycles less than a thousand, we will use this equation, this low cycle fatigue equation. 
If we're in the second part of the curve, if we're in the high cycle fatigue range, you'll notice our two inflection points are FFTU and the endurance limit. So we're going to use the exact same uh, equation, but now we're going to get different coefficients because the same is still a straight line on a log long curve. But now our intercept is up here at FFTU squared over S sub B, and our slope is this value here. Once again, this F is the strength fraction and not the F and not the calculated stress. What students tend to do is they forget to square that FFTU term. A lot of times they'll say F times FTU squared rather than the square of FFTU. Or they also sometimes will square this whole thing, squaring the endurance limit also. All that's going to throw your answers. Now you'll notice also since this is to a power that our answers, if you round off the numbers carelessly, your numbers are going to fluctuate quite a bit. So you're going to want to carry a lot of digits in your A and B numbers, especially the B number. Okay. So if we have a, a stress level in this upper range, we're going to use the first set of coefficients. In the lower range, we're going to have the second set. Next, if we have a stress level at or below the endurance limit, or if we have a number of cycles above 10 to the sixth, then we don't even need to plug into the equation because we just know that the endurance limit is uh, S sub E and the number of cycles is infinite. It's not 10 to the sixth anymore. If it's, a, it's 10 to six or more, it will last forever. That's what we're going to assume. Okay. All right. Now, Notice down here, determining low cycle versus high cycle fatigue. Now, once again, since we have different coefficients for the low cycle fatigue portion of the curve and the high cycle fatigue portion of the curve, when you're doing the analysis, you've got to be careful not to use the wrong coefficients. So for each stress level, you're going to want to first check to see, is that stress that you have applied, is it more than F times F to you? If it is, it's up in that upper piece, and you need to use the coefficients for low cycle fatigue. If your stress is below that value, then you're going to use the equation for high cycle fatigue. If your stress level is at or below the endurance limit, then you know you have infinite cycles. If you have a allowable that falls in either of those three ranges, once again, you'd also use these appropriate coefficients. Does that make sense? Okay. Here's a little example. We have a 1050 hot rolled steel. Uh, actually, properties that are in Shigley, we don't have properties for that in our book. The rotating endurance limit is at 10 to the 6. We want to find that. We want to find the endurance strength of the polished sample for 10 to the 4th cycles and the expected life if we have a fully reversed stress of 55 KSI. This is pretty straightforward using what we have in the book. First, we need our strength fraction. We go to this curve here. Actually, you're going to use the polynomial. Then we Calculate, we estimate our strength. We take 50% of the FTU, that's 45 KSI. That's less than 100 KSI, so it's valid. We then calculate our coefficients A and B, and then we plug those coefficients into the one equation to calculate the number of cycles, the stress level for 10 to the 4 cycles, or we can plug them into the equation with 55 KSI to calculate the number of cycles. Does that make sense? using those equations there. What this is doing, now we're not going to do a lot of this but with this, but actually what we see here, we have a round sample. Our leftmost sample is round. And if we load up that, so that if we, let's say it's polished cylinder, and if it's a polished cylinder, if we load it up under this fully reversed bending, eventually it's going to fail if our stress is high enough. And what we will see is beach marks look kind of like this. If we had had a square sample, a rectangular sample, doing the exact same thing, our failure would look like what's down below that. Now, if we have in the second figure, we see this little stress concentration. If we had a little groove in our shaft, it's going to change the way our beach marks look. If we have a sharper groove, it will change it even more. Now, that's all for high stresses. Now, if we had lower stresses, the rightmost three are the three corresponding. Now notice the difference. If we have a high stress, if our stress is really high, then we would expect it to fail once we've lost a small amount of area. As you can see here, you can see the fast fracture area, the gray area is quite large. In the right picture, in, which is the fourth little figure, 
you'll see when we have a low stress for the exact same sample, our beach marks go all the way through the part, nearly. And because the stress level is low, it doesn't fail fast fracture until a very small part of the area is left. That's how we can tell it was a low stress because actually there's a small area left with fast fracture. If it had been a high stress, it would have failed while we still had a large area like in the leftmost one. The lower set of curves shows how that looks for rectangular samples. This set of curves here shows how it looks for bending, unidirectional bending, and for fully reverse bending. This shows how it looks for torsion, okay, and for rotational bending, okay? So we're actually not going to do a lot with this, but you can kind of study this if you have a lot of interest. With this sample, what we see is another, another failed sample. It looks like we had a start. You can see the upper part looks kind of smooth, which means the beach marks are so, it, it, the crack develops so slowly, you can't even hardly see the difference between cycles. Eventually, you see beach marks across the thing as they move away for some kind of defect. Okay, so the actual initialization stage was up here somewhere around B, and then beach marks happen very slowly, then it happened faster, and then it looks like we fast fractured at, at C, at that small little area there. Okay, here's another example. This is a piston. You can see it looks like they have a little defect at the far left. You've got beach marks going from there, and then looks like most of the sample was involved in fast fracture, which means it probably was a rather high loading. This sample here looks weird because actually it looks like the beach marks all happen near the middle, not near the edge like we'd normally expect. And what it appears here is they had a manufacturing defect. When they manufactured it, they had a little defect here in the middle, and that defect worked its way outward until it eventually just failed. And you see the fast fracture on the outside. If we look at some examples, some conceptual problems, what is a fully reverse stress? Ask yourself this. Is it one that produces compression? Is it one that always points backwards or one that has the same magnitude and tension and compression? Right? Okay. What is the maximum fully reverse stress this section can withstand for eternal repeated load? Got that? If a steel part has these allowables, what would you estimate is the endurance limit? Well, the pristine endurance limit is going to be half of FTU, right? And it's less than the cutoff, so that's the correct value. How many fully reverse cycles of this stress level can a part withstand? Well, for in the endurance limit and below, it'd be infinite, right? Infinite life, supposedly. What is the endurance limit for aluminum? Now it appears that aluminum has no endurance limit, like it keeps on dropping, but we're gonna go ahead and use a factor of about 40% of our FTU, okay? If aluminum part has these properties, what would we estimate as the endurance limit? Well, you take 40% of FTU. Now one word of warning. We're still using S sub B e as the pristine value because we haven't learned to convert the endurance limit from that perfect value to a realistic value. We're going to learn that in the next lecture. Okay, That's all that I have. Make sure you study this carefully. We're going to be building on this idea in the next three lectures. We're going to be using everything we found here, but we're going to be modifying it to be making it better. That's all I got. Enjoy.